Welcome back, brothers and sisters. I am Braden. This guy over here is Tim, and this is Second Legacy, and thank you so much for stopping by. Now, some of you may have seen me on Langley Outdoors and him on Military Arms Channel, but we have come together in this new channel called Second Legacy, and I am glad that you have found us because the sole mission of this channel is to provide deeper analysis, really get in there and pass the blessing of the Second Amendment along to the next generation through, like I said, deeper analysis and really hitting these points that are so useful in having conversations with either anti-gunners or somebody on the fence. But with that introduction out of the way, definitely make sure you subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share this out because we'd love to have you help the uh, channel to grow as much as possible if you like the content. But today what we're going to talk about is something that is a little bit irony, a little bit government overreach, and a little bit just interesting, the Alec Baldwin situation. Now I'm going to set this up kind of high level, and then I'm going to throw it over to Tim, and we're going to start breaking this down because like I said, this has elements almost everywhere. So I'm sure you guys have heard. Alec Baldwin was involved in a very terrible accident on set, on the set of Rust, the show that he was on. Now, there's been a recent development which is prompting this conversation because, again, it has tie-ins everywhere. Alec Baldwin, one of the charges against him has been dropped. Now, this is the heavy one. This would have been a five-year prison sentence if it were to be actually convicted. Now, here's where it gets interesting. The way that he got off, or at least that he, the way that he got the prosecutors to drop this charge, is that it was a retroactive application of a law that was not in place when the, uh, when the situation occurred. Now, of course, this opens so many things, but before I get too deep down the rabbit hole, Tim, let me throw it over to you. Hope you're having a great one. Let's get it. All right. So first of all, I want to preface this conversation by stating the fact that I never in my entire life thought I would be defending Alec Baldwin on anything. Facts. <laughs> but here... And re with regards to the issue that you're talking about, I have to defend him in that it is wrong for the state to retroactively charge people. And so, yep. in essence, what happened was the incident took place on the set of Rust. Then later, a law passed that then the prosecutors retroactively applied to uh, Mr. Baldwin's case and then tried to get him a five-year mandatory sentence should he be convicted. Now, this is very similar to... It's similar but dissimilar to what the ATF has tried to pull with the braces, and we'll get into that mm -hmm. discussion here momentarily. But this is a, an, another example of gross overreach by a government entity. The government has this nasty tendency to do things like this, not just the federal but sometimes state governments. And what I find rather shocking about this is that they should know better. Mm -hmm. The prosecutor presumably went to law school. <laughs> I think that's a prerequisite for holding the position. Therefore, those, they should yeah. understand what they were attempting to do and that it, somebody in some meeting should have said, uh, hello, I don't think we can do this. So it's amazing to me that it got as, it went as long as it did with the charges sticking until them just being announced this past week that this charge in particular was being dropped. Mm -hmm. And that's... And that's the craziest part about this entire story is, first of all, you've got the irony of ironies that an actor who is overtly anti-gun, full gun control, is using the argument of unconstitutionality of gun control laws to get himself out of trouble. First of all, you, you've got that level of irony all by itself, which is a thing. But then going back to what Tim just said, why would a state prosecutor knowingly put this in the charges unless you were trying to make a statement and a political point because you don't have anything to stand on legally. The law was not in place when this infringement occurred. So how could you possibly charge someone for something that wasn't even a law? This is akin to speeding down a road, excuse me, not even speeding, driving down a road at 45 miles an hour in a 45 mile an hour uh, zone then two years later, they change the speed limit to 35 and then give you a ticket for $10 or for 10 miles an hour over. It just doesn't make sense. It's not feasibly even possible. And yet they do it anyway. I mean, Tim and I were talking offline before this episode. You've got multiple states that are hell bent on gun control doing whatever they want because they just want to. And it's almost a virtue signal rather than an application of justice. And in this one case, this not only stops at Alec Baldwin, this has other little tendrils that are going to go into all sorts of different things because the whole point here is you can't charge someone for something that didn't exist. There cannot be penalties for things that were not laws, which is getting really close to something that we've hit so many times through the ATF, Chevron deference, pistol brace rule, ghost gun reapplication, redefinition. There are so many ways 
And the ultimate irony, again, is that Alec Baldwin may have just laid the groundwork to go after those exact same things. Yeah, it's it's rather surprising to me, and hopefully the courts hold the ATF in particular accountable with this brace ruling, for example, right? So the ATF would argue, and they probably will argue in court, that the law regarding NFA items and SBRs and all that stuff hasn't changed. It's their interpretation that's changed. Therefore, they're not retroactively charging people that purchased braces for 10 years that the ATF deemed them to be legal accessories. So it's not really a law that was changed that's now being retroactively applied. The law and their argument is has always been there. It's just that their opinion has changed. In my mind, that's splitting hairs and it's the same thing. And hopefully the courts agree with us when we finally get this to the courts. But like you said, this is dangerously close to what we're facing as the two-way community with regards to ATF decisions regarding braces and bump stocks and 80% lowers and all that stuff that you brought up. Oh, absolutely. And that's, and see, like, this is where I think, and this is, this is the fun part of the conversation because one of the things that I love about what we do on a regular basis, what we all do on our own channels, we get surprising results from surprising places. Like, for example, two years ago, if you had told me that the ATF might be in question in a lawsuit because of something that Alec Baldwin used as a defense against the gun charge and that that was unconstitutional, that's a whole lot of question marks that I have questions around. It's like, how is that even possible? But the amazing thing about this is freedom can actually come from an anti-gunner who is going against a gun control law because it would have its own skin. And that's where it comes into it when it's actually applied to them. It's different. Just like you don't need a gun to protect yourself, we shouldn't have guns available for the population because they're dangerous. But those special people, they can have guns and they can have guards around them and they can be protected. But not the little people because you are not responsible enough to have your rights. And that's that's the big thing. Yeah. And, and keep in mind, and I'm paraphrasing, I was trying to find the original tweet, but this is the guy that tweeted, I wonder what it must feel like to accidentally hurt somebody, you know, with a firearm. He tweeted that. And then years later, we find that he presumably, I mean, we don't know what happened yet, hasn't been to court, but accidentally, uh, you know, shot uh, Miss Hutchkin. So it, it's something that to me, like you said, the irony of it, this guy is rapidly anti-gun. This guy has gone after the 2A community, has been very poignant in his attacks on our community. He thinks that all guns should be banned, but yet here and a, a, an amazing act of hypocrisy, the man makes his money selling fake violence in movies and then winds up on a set mishandling a firearm, points it at somebody and winds up causing irreparable harm. I mean, somebody died, another person was injured. And then this whole thing comes out where, you know, live rounds were introduced into the set. And these, I would bet most of those people with perhaps the exception of the armors, but who knows, most of these people would have an anti 2 a stance and think that all the guns that they're using in the production of these movies should be banned from private ownership. Yet here they are using those same tools to make millions of dollars and then also mishandling them and winding up causing the accidental death of others. I mean, the hypocrisy is just the meter is like pegging out like at 110 percent on this one. Oh, oh, absolutely. Especially when you look at anybody who's involved in the gun world, the first thing that you're taught ever. I don't care who you are. The first person, the first thing you're taught is the safety rules, the basic safety rules. If you had someone who was extremely familiar with firearms, who is actually even moderately familiar, you would know that you don't put live cartridges near something that is not intended to go down range. That's just, you just don't do that. And the safety element is something that we stress so heavily. I've seen on Tim's channel multiple times, a big catalyst for his videos are safety, proper procedure, and overall safe enjoyment of the Second Amendment. That's a huge piece for all of us. And for anti-gun people to come forward and say all the things that we routinely hear, but then at the exact same time ignore the safety rules or, or – now I can't really say they ignored safety rules because I personally wasn't there. But to have dangerous instances present themselves – it's, it says a lot about the different cultures, but I want to hit one more thing that you just hit on. The important thing here is we need to defend unconstitutionality 
no matter where or against unconstitutionality, no matter where it is. So from a Second Amendment perspective, yes, we're very used to fighting off unconstitutional gun laws, unconstitutional gun infringements. We've got entire states that are dedicated to that movement. However, when something goes against one of the people who is anti-gun, it's important that we continue to support. That is unconstitutional. I may, not like, I may not like that person. I may not agree with any of their politics, but at the end of the day, that is the Second Amendment, and they are infringing on the Second Amendment, and it is unconstitutional because that gets us to points like this where we can have validity in our conversations when we go forward on things like the ATF. I mean, that that is, I think, important. And the irony is, I doubt Mr. Baldwin would defend any of us in our actions. You know, if, if we were charged illegally or unconstitutionally with the crime, he would, you know, probably not support our, you know, defense and trying to get that undone. But here we are as two A advocates routinely attacked by this man. Yet, because we believe in freedom, we believe in the Constitution, we're saying, yeah, this prosecutor screwed up. He should not be retroactively charged with the crime. That's not just, even if we don't like the man. That doesn't factor into this whatsoever because what separates us from the gun grabbers is that we believe in freedom. We truly believe in liberty and we truly believe in the Constitution. And we have to evenly and, and equitably apply that across the spectrum because if we don't, we become the hypocrites that they are. And therefore, yep. we don't, you know, our arguments no longer hold water and, and we no longer hold the moral high ground. And so mm -hmm. we have to stand up. To things like this, even like you said, if we don't like the particular actor in this case, um, and the word actor, I mean, <laughs> actor in the yeah, situation, right. even though he, <laughs> he is an actor too. Um, but I tell you, it it the, the whole thing for me, uh, I mean, it's just a sad event that took place that was so easily avoided. And this is a little bit off subject, but this is something after this occurred that I thought about. It's 2023. Why are prop houses still using functioning firearms as props in movies with CGI where it is and things like that. I just wonder why they're not using blank guns that can't even chamber a live cartridge because this isn't the first time something like this has happened right. in Hollywood. And it's it just mind boggling to me that in 2023 or 2022, I think is when this took place, a live round made it onto a set into an actual gun and it was discharged and people were injured by that again. So it, it, that's just to me, that's just kind of weird <laughs> that we yeah. haven't Hollywood hasn't moved past that and, and truly made these firearms safe because we all know these actors, for the most part, there's a few actors that have come forward and said, look, I take personal responsibility when I'm handed a gun on set. I, I check it to make sure that it's not loaded with live ammunition. I check it to make sure that it's empty. It doesn't even have a blank in it. But then you have Alec Baldwin coming up saying it's not my job. That's what I hired right. them for. No. Yep. What happens when you go into a gun store? Yep. And you say, can I see the gun on the wall? If protocol is followed, the person behind the counter takes the weapon off the, the rack, clears it, makes sure it's empty, then hands it to you. You, in turn, should double check, make sure that the weapon is empty, and then handle it in a safe manner. Finger off the trigger. Don't muzzle anybody with the gun if you can avoid it. And so those are things that are ingrained into us. But here you have him trying to absolve himself of all responsibility and trying to push that off onto somebody else on set, when in reality, safety falls upon all of us. It's incumbent for all yep. of us to practice safe firearms handling. Oh, 100 percent. And that's the to me, that's that's one of the things that's so sad about the gun control movement is because when the gun control movement looks at a firearm, it looks at the Second Amendment. It's always in a negative light. It's never that's an inanimate object. It's always that is bad. That is evil. Don't touch. Don't learn. Don't know. Don't do anything. So when the problem occurs, in this case, right, like neither one of us were there, so we can't say what did or did not happen. However, we as Second Amendment advocates and even knowledgeable gun Americans, we would always check a firearm. You always do it. You never point at anything you're not willing to destroy. Treat every gun like it's always loaded. Point it downrange and you know where your bullets are ending. Like those are just basics. But if you're passing it off to saying, well, I mean, they handed me a gun. I can't be responsible for what happened. That's not good enough. And I think that's where the real responsibility comes in. I don't think that it's a scenario where the state needs to come in and put you in prison for retroactively charging you for a law that didn't exist. I think it has to be much more on a personal like a personal liability level. You did not take responsibility through knowledge before you even touched the gun. You didn't learn about it. You just said, oh, you're taking this? It's perfectly fine? Okay, cool. 
it's beyond, well, someone else handed it to me. It's on them. That's, that's never something that you would hear in a gun range that safety is paramount in the second amendment community. And I just think that that's one of the things that gets lost when you aren't even familiar with how they work or the safety rules. Yeah. And, 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 you know, this is just something that, that falls upon him as, as an individual and a person. If you take a look at Alec Baldwin, who, you know, rails against gun, uh, gun ownership in the United States, thinks that all guns should be banned. He's anti-gun. He's out there making anti-gun statements. And again, he's out there making money with the use of firearms or in some cases, the misuse of firearms in his movies. Then you contrast him to somebody like Keanu Reeves and John Wick. We've all seen the videos, most of us anyway, have seen the videos of Keanu Reeves out getting actual firearms instruction on a live range, shooting live ammunition and rehearsing how to safely handle and use those firearms before he ever steps onto the set of John Wick. So there's an example. And I have no idea where Keanu Reeves falls in the issue of, of you know, gun control and the, the debate of gun control. I don't know where he falls on that because I kind of like it that way with the Hollywood elites. I kind of don't <laughs> care what their politics are. But so if we just judge him by his actions, here you have a responsible actor going out of his way to learn the safe and proper use of firearms before actually filming something. And then you contrast that with Alec Baldwin, who's out there saying, you shouldn't own guns, you shouldn't own guns. I don't know if he's ever had any formal firearms training. Maybe he has. That was a requirement for a movie he, he took part in years ago or something. I don't know. But certainly by his actions with the single action revolver on the set of Rust, he, if you ask me, you know, based upon what he did, it doesn't seem like he's had any formal instruction. And if he right. has... He's long since forgotten it. Correct. Oh, no, 100%. 100%. And that's, and that's the big piece, kind of going back and tying this back into where this leads us, is if you apply this exact same logic about the retroactivity, right? So with the ATS pistol brace rule, the reason that this is such a big deal with the Alec Baldwin thing is this has ramifications across the board. So if you have something that openly is in the press that says you can't be retroactively charged for something that wasn't even a law at that point. Well, how can you defend the ATS perspective on changing rules on pistol braces when you've got an entire population for 10 years taking part in a legal activity and all of a sudden it changed because of interpretation per what Tim was saying earlier. That's, that's where this becomes much bigger than this one actor in you know, every way of the term. But What's the ATF going to say? Well, yeah, no, but that is the law. But then we changed the interpretation and we did it twice, actually. And then we did it also with bump stocks. We also did it with 80 percent receivers. We changed all these definitions at a certain point. It's kind of hard to defend how many changes of definitions of common words that you're doing to affect felony level penalties. And I think that's where this huge I don't even know the right word quagmire really starts to unravel. Yeah, I think. That's, you know, you hit on something really important there. You know, if it was just a simple rule change, like, oh, this is how we view things now. Therefore, these can no longer be sold. That would be a tougher court case to fight. Right. But what mm -hmm. ATF has done is said, oh, you know what? <laughs> our bad. Um, we're going to go ahead and change our minds here yet again. And we're changing the rules. We're retroactively going to apply the rules. Oh, and then we're going to assign criminal penalty, which includes up to 10 years in prison and $250,000 in fines for each offense that we charge you with. So it, it's beyond a rule, in my opinion, because when a rule carries the weight of law and it has a criminal punishment associated with it, it's no mm -hmm. longer a rule. That is a law. And you just change yep. the law. And so Correct. that is going to be the argument, at least one of the arguments that we take to court against the ATF. And if we have, you know, if we have justices that aren't political activists that look at the Constitution and apply it accurately to the case, there's only one way they can decide. ATF, you can't do this. But right. we'll see. Well, I think I think the key point, kind of the last point to add in on that is you're looking at favorable at least districts or circuits right now, right? So you've got one of those cases that you're talking about that's that's filed in Texas with Ken Paxton, the AG of Texas. Then you've got one that's filed in, I believe it was North Dakota with 25 other states. This is this is going to go somewhere and it's gonna go beyond the level it's, it's at now. My, if I can't really offer a conjecture of what will happen and how it will happen, but my money would at least be, this will not be the last time. It, this isn't gonna stop at one, you know? No. Um, but I think that we have done a very good job. And when I say we, I mean the gun community in general, we took the hit of that ATF ruling 
or the rule change, we slowly assessed what happened, made the best move that was possible, and now we move forward and basically say your move ATF. I think I think that's a good assessment what we gone we've kind of gone into, but that's kind of a different video for a different time, but you know. I would agree. <laughs> so with all that being said, folks, if you enjoyed today's video, please take a moment to like, share, and subscribe. Do share this video with your friends because once again, what we're hoping to do here is to help enable you to have conversations with coworkers, family members, or anybody else that might be anti-gun or as Braden said, setting on the fence on the topic. And we can best do that by helping to spread the word of our constitutional rights and the arguments that we make as a community in defense of our rights. So if you'll take a brief moment there to join the channel, that would be awesome. You have a little thanks button underneath the video player you're watching right now. Mash that thanks button and support us here at Second Legacy. And we'll see you next time until we uh, have some more stuff to talk about. And we always seem to have stuff to talk about, don't we? <laughs> we do.